Uh, call our meeting to order. <laughs> it is Thursday, May 18th. This meeting is being broadcast and recorded by WCTV and audio recorded by Jamie Wixton. Would you please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll begin tonight's meeting with public participation. And I see we have a unique member in the audience tonight. Uh, Dr. DeAndrea, would you like do, to we do. explain so this like character? To, I would <laughs> like to introduce the school committee to Gigi. Um, Gigi visited Wareham Elementary School for STEAM night this evening and thought that she would stop by and say hi to the school committee. Oh. Uh, Gigi is the penguin in the ST Math software game. Students help Gigi uh, overcome obstacles by solving math puzzles. Gigi crosses the screen every time a student demonstrates understanding of a math concept, leading the student to the next challenging puzzle. Um, with well-designed learning games, students are intri intrinsically motivated to keep trying. They, they persist because they are engaged and believe they can succeed. By design, game levels will get more difficult but always have a possible solution. GG becomes the personification of trying. Others may give up, but when trying to explain something, but Gigi never does. Gigi provides helpful feedback no matter how many times you try and has confidence that you can solve the puzzle. As students persevere in problem solving, they develop a belief in themselves that has powerful effects on learning. It develops confidence, it develops perseverance, um, increased learning capacity and higher achievement. Here in Wareham, students in grades K through six have been working with Gigi for the past four years. On one of the handouts that you have, you can see the, a report of last week's usage of the program, as well as research about why we use ST Math here. Teachers can see all the students all that the students are doing and assign standards to match what they are doing in class as review or as preview. We will be looking at correlations between assessment data and ST math puzzles locally, but nationally students who play uh, score higher than students who do not. Our students like it so much that Wareham Elementary School won this GG costume <laughs> for March Mathness. You see that? March, <laughs> I'll say it again, <laughs> mathness. Nice. Out of 95 schools, we won. Um, and so I just want to say thank you to Gigi for being here. Thank, thank you, Gigi. <laughs> and Gigi does not want to speak, that is correct. Gigi doesn't speak. Can't speak. I, I see. I, I, How many and, and, do you know that speak? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gigi. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Is there a pool to, to figure out who Gigi really is? <laughs> if you would like to have, have a pool, we could set one up. Sure. <laughs> I think we had a pool for Gigi. <laughs> <laughs> I think Gigi's leaving. Bye, Gigi. Thank Bye, you. Gigi. Bye, Gigi. Thank you. We should at least throw us a fish or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know how to follow that exactly, but um, do we have any other public participation? <laughs> Seeing none and no other uh, amorphized animals in the building, we will uh, we'll go on to good news. May all our public participation be so succinct. <laughs> exactly, I, I agree. Um, anyone with good news? I, I just say that um, I just uh, came from STEAM night at the elementary school, it was, um, uh, very, very well attended. Lots and lots of families and students and some great uh, activities for the kids to participate in and the, and the parents to participate in and grandparents and family members. Um, and a lot of involvement uh, by the community, which was great to see. The police were there. 
um, and some of the organizations around town. So thank you to all of them. It was a, uh, a great event. And an art show. And an art show, yes. Thank you. Thank you. April. I don't know if this is partially stealing some of Indy's thunder, but um, the track team will be participating um, this weekend in the um, SCC championship um, meet. It was moved from Saturday to Sunday um, at 1 o'clock in Seekonk. So we want to wish the track team um, luck at conference. And tomorrow is the last day of school for the seniors. <laughs> I don't know if that's good news or not, but I'm super proud of all the kids that I know who are um, getting ready to graduate, and it's it's going to be an exciting couple of weeks for the for the seniors. So, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ms. Faye. Do I come up? Oh, just so we can hear you at the mic. Oh. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share that we, um, Mr. Palladino, recently um, he was participating in. A wear him coalition meeting and he shared with us um, something that came from high point that we've added to our website it's on the main page of the website it's also on the homeless page and on the special education page and it is called the street sheet um, it is a collection of all the local resources for families from mental health to food pantries to clothing to senior and housing um, all different kinds of services for people to access it it's all on one beautiful sheet and former Wareham um, teacher alumni, Jan Barton, um, had a huge part in putting that together for Turning Point, because I'm on the board with her there as well, and she did a lot of work to put that together. So it's great to see Wareham teachers still giving back to the community like that. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, item number four. This is Indiana's Farewell Student Representative Report. <laughs> so no pressure, Indiana, but... Uh, so it's going to be a longer one, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to get through it fast. Um, all right, so some things coming up. There will be a car wash this Saturday at the fire station in West Wareham. That will be to benefit the class of 2026, um, and that will be from 12 to 4. Hopefully the weather will hold off for them. Um, the annual DECA auction, the 44th annual, um, so 44 years we've been doing this, will be held this Sunday from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Um, several items will be auctioned off by a Wareham graduate, Colonel Philip Gomes. Um, they have a four-pack of Red Sox tickets, a four-pack of Nantucket Ferry tickets, a 55-inch Smart TV, Patriots tickets, basically everything. So. Um, please go to that. Tickets can be purchased at the door. Um, yeah. Wareham High School had its spring concert this past Wednesday. Um, they had the chorus, beginner band, advanced band, jazz workshop, jazz ensemble, um, all performed, and it was awesome. They celebrated the spring. They were all wearing their Hawaiian uh, clothes, and it was really nice. Um, the art show was on May 10th, the high school art show. Uh, this event, it was a fairy theme, which was really interesting. So members of the Honor Society and Student Council volunteered to do face painting and chalk art and fairy dust for kids. Um, there was music from the band, and of course all the artwork was on display. Um, so great job to Mrs. Dion, Ms. Sharples, and Ms. Cuno, uh, Mr. Roth, and Chef Breda for organizing the event and all of the students involved in that. Um, National Honor Society inducted its, or its new spring members this past Tuesday. So congratulations to all of the new Honor Society inductees. Um, Dr. DeAndre was there, so thank you for being there um, to welcome them in. And congratulations to the new class officers and student council officers who have also been elected recently. Um, as April said, last day for seniors is tomorrow, and I can tell you that some people, it would be good news, but <laughs> some of us it's not. Um, so our senior exit interviews and finals will take place next week. Um, prom was this past Saturday for the senior class. It was at the Cape Club in Falmouth. It was amazing. Um, perfect venue, perfect time. All the students loved it. Even Mr. Palladino loved it um, and showed us some of his dance moves. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so thank you to Ms. Tarasconi, um, the class advisor, Mrs. Medina, the student council advisor, and all the chaperones uh, who helped coordinate the event. 
Uh, the senior car parade will be this coming Tuesday, so next Tuesday, May 23rd. The parade starts at 6, and it'll start at Merchant's Way, go down Main Street, and end up at the high school. Um, so please go and line the streets in support of the senior class. Graduation will be held at Spillane Field on Friday, June 2nd, and this is, of course, open to the public, and will start at 6.30 p.m. And as many of you know, um, it is my last school committee meeting tonight. Um, because in over two weeks from now, just over two weeks from now, I will no longer be a student, which kind of doesn't make sense for a student representative to not be a student. So um, since I was in fifth grade, I remember being so eager to sit up on this table on behalf of the student body and represent our amazing Wareham students. While I'm sad that my time's coming to a close, I'm so excited for Gisela Priestley to serve in this position next year. And I know she'll be an amazing advocate for all the Wareham students. Um, I want to thank Mr. Palladino. I know he's not here, but he's been an incredible mentor to me over the past five years and has shaped me into the person I am today. Um, and before I was sitting up here, I was often sitting next to him in the audience. Um, and he would, he would always sit next to me and then remind me that I should go home and study. And I always <laughs> stayed until the end. So um, thank you to Mrs. Medina and the student council for giving me the opportunity to serve here. Um, and to the middle school student council for sparking my passion in student voice and representation. Thank you to all the school committee members, um, Dr. Schwamm, Dr. Deandra, and Jamie Wixton for always helping me out along the way um, and valuing my input and comments. And finally, thank you to the students of Wareham from kindergarten through 12th grade who make this just district so unique and excellent and who are absolutely worth fighting for every day. There's so much pride in this district from its faculty and staff to the students to the administration. I'm so proud to have gotten the world cl class education that I did from Wareham Public Schools. I'm proud to be a Viking, proud to be sporting my Vikings tie for one last time, one of the last times ever, um, and proud to say this concludes my final report. So, oh, Mr. Sweat. So. I wanted to know what year you plan to run for a school committee. <laughs> Four years from now. <laughs> he's not, well, I, I, I'm betting he's probably telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> it's see you later, not goodbye. <laughs> so, Indy, we have a certificate of recognition for you. It says, presented to Indiana Troop on behalf of the school committee in appreciation for your service as student representative for the Wayham School Committee. And I just want to thank you for always being so articulate well prepared and for representing the students of Wayham so well and also the community of Wayham so well. So thank you, you'll get the certificate, you get to keep your name placard, bring that home with you tonight please. Awesome. And you can save it for when you're back up here. <laughs> okay, next we have the Director of Finance report. Good evening, everyone. Congratulations, Indy, and to all your classmates as well. I'm sure that's a very proud accomplishment, and you all should be proud and excited for the future. So I've enjoyed um, working with you with, at the school committee meeting. So best of luck to you and your classmates. So I have a few things for you all tonight. Uh, the first report I have is the April financial report. Um, it's a similar format that you see. So. Uh, right now, we're coming down to the end of the fiscal year, so we're looking at all of our accounts, our expenditures, our encumbrances, checking our purchase orders, um, trying to close out some that we may not need. So we're really trying to get to uh, an anticipated year-end balance, uh, you know, day by day. It's looking that it's going to be very, very close uh, getting to year-end, as I mentioned. We have had uh, projecting probably uh, a, a deficit of about 360,000 in salaries, which can be covered by uh, the budget freeze, some other expenditure accounts, but it may come down to having to cover some of that with some other funds, and I'm going to speak about those later in my presentation, so we may have to use some of our other revolving funds to cover. But there's a few things that we're still um, 
looking into uh, discussing with health insurance, other accounts. We want to make sure that some of the encumbrances that we have, they're truly needed. If not, that'll help us out. So it's going to be just a busy next uh, month or so just monitoring the budget. Um, I don't know if anyone has any specific questions about the April budget report. Jeff? In looking at the, the summary document mm -hmm. of the seven major categories, mm -hmm. um, the, the, one, the category that had the most transfers in uh, was pupil services. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume that's Melissa's favorite budget. Um, in retrospect, and maybe you can defer to Melissa if you like, that's up to you. In retrospect, um, and I realize this wasn't your budget. Um, how did that happen? What was the primary reason for that to occur? Because that's the largest percentage. Correct. So in this instance, even though it the um, the title is Pupil Services, which is the Department of Ed Code, it's not um, student services. So it's not the student services that we think of with Melissa. Melissa's accounts are mostly instructional accounts oh, really? or tuition accounts, which are the 9,000s. So here, the 3,000s is transportation ah. and transportation and some student activities, which in this case is mostly athletics. So in this case here, you're going to see transfers tonight for transportation and it's mostly our out of district transportation at this at this point in time. So it's those very costly uh, vendor transportation that were required for students who are in out of district placements or who are in uh, foster student transportation or homeless transportation. And some of those are upwards of three, four hundred dollars per day per student. So so, in my mind, that mm -hmm. still is Melissa's area. Mm -hmm. is, it, know, yes, it is it is yeah, it is, it's transportation, uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. okay. of, of students that are in her area, correct. Um, and maybe I'll save my other question for the transfers. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. So, but to also to answer your question, in, ret in retrospect, um, looking at this, of course, we were doing the budget early on in the fiscal year. So it's some of these accounts that are, are out of district placements, especially those that are more transient, it's very hard to predict, so I've always looked back at what the history has been, looked to see who, who the students that we're transporting currently, now remember this was back in November, December, and projected if those same students were here a year from then, what would that cost be? So that's how I came about. So hopefully, you know, that's a, it's a, it's the best baseline we could use at the time to predict for next year. But a lot of factors come into play with that, whether or not we can transport some of these routes in-house, uh, whether or not we're seeing more vendors enter into special ed transportation, so maybe that's more competition. You know, maybe we can, if there's more, if we're getting more vendors to bid on these routes, because we do bid them out every, every route that we have, and we go with the best price. So more competition, perhaps, but right now it's something that I know, I was just at a school business officials conference today, and that was the topic um, that we spent about the last hour on with the Cape Cod area business managers, was what are we, how can we, you know, improve transportation and, and control costs and work together to, you know, to figure out how to get some of these students to the places that they need to go. So is that a very detailed, articulate way of saying your level of comfort with next year's budget is, is better than, than the results from this year's budget? Um, certainly yes, because I have some, some history for myself, you know, for, for doing it. So I can look back to, you know, what we budgeted and why. So I think it, that is that, but I think in years to come, it will, you know, in, in some respects be a little bit easier and a little bit more predictable, but there are always those uh, budget line items and this transportation, out of district transportation, and even out of district tuition is one of them because it, they're just so each individual um, student can be so costly and sometimes unpredictable. So, um, you know, you, you just budget for what you have, what you know of at the time, 
and certainly, you know, in years past, I know in my previous district, we, we could, many years ago, put in a buffer for students, but then as budgets got tighter and tighter, those buffers, you know, had to be let go of, uh, you know, in order to maintain what we knew we had, not what we might have. You know, it's interesting, from my finance committee days, mm -hmm. I remember that there are two town accounts where they can go over budget. One is snow and mm -hmm. ice, snow and, ice. and mm -hmm. I think the other one was legal fees, but I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure. But I remember snow and ice was definitely one of them. You don't have any accounts like that, do you? Well, the school department budget is a, is a line item, is a one line budget. So what that means is, is we, the school department, unlike town departments, can go over their budgets and they are able to do budget transfers throughout the year because the school committee has line item authority on their budget lines. Fair so enough. in that okay. case, yes, but the bottom line um, at that point, that's what, that's what we're zeroing in on right now and that's what we're, I'm looking at closely and we're, you know, given any time, you know, every payroll, we look and predict um, based on, on the payroll what we're looking at for salary surpluses, deficits. And and certainly some salary accounts are known, right? You know what your um, contracted salaries are going to be. But what we don't know is those substitutes or maybe some of those hourly wages that might vary. Certainly the substitutes would vary from week to week. So it, it makes it a little tough. Some weeks you feel a little bit better. Some weeks you think, oh, I mean, we're not in as good a place. So it's, you know, it, it is coming down to the wire, but it's just looking at the budget almost, you know, at least once a week, if not more. April? Do you think that with the change from this year going forward to next year with the COVID requirements that the, the sub um, lines might be significantly less because te the, the holding period of how many days you're required to be out has, will have changed? I hope that that's, that's helpful. Um, I think it's been very difficult to budget in the past couple of years with COVID in some, in some line items and subs being one of them. So perhaps the utilization may or may not be higher, but you just don't have that history to look back to because we really, up until what last school year, we didn't have a good normal school year to look at. And that certainly I think comes into play with a lot of the, some of the line items, you know, that, that we look at when you look to budget. But, you know, hopefully, you know, when I, when we looked at the budget for next year for subs, we looked at uh, our, what we had used last year for subs and tried to bring the sub budget up as much as possible to what we thought we had been using. And, um, you know, so that remains to be seen. I know that is one area that a lot of school districts do struggle with as well. But, you know, you, that is a good point. Hopefully, you know, we can, we can have some lower, some lower costs in sub areas. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, my next, the next report is the budget transfer. So as I mentioned, I have a budget transfer for uh, transportation, special ed transportation in and out of district. Now this is a result of um, an additional route that has routes that are coming into place. Uh, I believe it was a student who did not require transportation, but for the last several months will require transportation. And then there's some other, there was a small deficit leading into that. So that is one, uh, one transfer and the, the budget line that I'm looking to transfer from is replacement of motor vehicles. Uh, that was a line <coughs> item that was not used in the budget this year and you know I don't foresee it being used so we can safely transfer that into transportation. The other area is uh, high school athletic director and coaches salaries. So what I looked at is we do have, as of the last payroll, we had a deficit in the salary line and I looked to project it out to June 30th to cover that deficit from, you know, just to do one transfer hopefully into that line item. And I know we've talked about this in the past is that going forward, uh, what we tried to do in the budget is look at budget for the coaches that we had listed in in the collective bargaining agreement so you know it's my hope that 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 this won't be uh, an issue next year that we will have budgeted for all of the coaches and again I think some of this is uh, 
quite possibly a result of just coming out of the pandemic and resuming normal school operations that maybe it was harder to predict in the past, um, you know, what you were going to have, what you're going to be able to do and have for coaches and need for coaches. And, and so I think, you know, this is just getting us back to, to, to normal operations, fortunately. Sure. I confess I was surprised to see that transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, we literally didn't budget for a coach. Um, the budget line item. I mean, that, when, that's right. multiple mm -hmm. coaches. That amount is multiple coaches. It's not one coach that we missed. So, yeah, I know it's not your budget. I yeah, okay. But bottom line, I was very surprised to see we couldn't even budget coaches accurately. Um, but the bottom line is, there was insufficient dollars in the budget to cover the number of coaches which is based on the sports that we have. Mm -hmm. right? right, they're based on the sports that we, we currently have that we, and this, we didn't this add any, school year. We didn't add any mm -hmm. sports. Mm -hmm. So what this is was the deficit of, uh, that you saw, the current budget, that was after I think the, one of the first, uh, the first half perhaps of the spring coach's salary. So what we'll need is to overcome that deficit and then the remainder of the, the balance of the salaries for the coach and the athletic director. Yeah, I get it. A quick question mm -hmm. on... And so some of this line item actually does include any employees who are officials or working at games, just a small, small amount, certainly not the big amount, not the, co not the salaries, but perhaps some of the small amounts that employees may earn working at ath athletic events. Okay. Um, so you mentioned substitute teachers, mm -hmm. another difficult line item to predict, to project, rather. Um, when I look at the three line items for the three schools, um, because it's not, there's not just one line item, it's, it's three, uh, the middle school had actually had, uh, isn't using all of its budget, the high school is using a lot more than its budget, and the elementary school is using a little more than its budget. Is, and I, I would hope the answer to this question is yes, but something is gonna, something tells me the answer is not, as simple as, does, can I construe from that that those represent different levels of attendance, absenteeism, if you will, based on those three schools, or is it not that simple? Um, I don't think it's that simple. I, we have to look into it further, but it could be a factor of whether the original budget was sufficient, because look at what each school has in comparison to each the other school versus how many teachers and paras they have. Um, the, the bathroom monitors come out of the substitute lines. So that comes into play. Whatever, so there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of factors that so I don't think that you could necessarily look at the expenditures of one school over another and and draw a straight line to whether or not they have a higher or lower absenteeism. Although candidly if I were you and I don't want to be you um, <laughs> I would be very tempted in going into a budget process to say, okay, if my absenteeism level was X, okay, how much would that cost me in substitute teachers, and is that a reasonable mm -hmm. X, whatever that number is? Um, but that's just my mathematical right. mind that, way of mm -hmm. looking at it, and it's never quite that simple, is it? Yeah. But that is, that, is a good, that is a good thought, that is a good idea. Yeah, and then hold the principals to, right. uh, to that level of absenteeism because that's a reasonable level of abs absenteeism. Anyway, I'm done, sorry. I, I think <laughs> with subs too, what helped last year is that there was an additional 125,000 from the state around spring of last year. That was a one-time you know, money from the state that said use it however you want and that helped cover the sub. So even with that, there was a deficit, I believe, last year. So when I looked at that, I factored that, like recouping that 125 plus whatever else. So that's, and then it got to levels that were higher than what the FY20 budget, four budget, could bear for substitutes. So uh, this is definitely going to be one to watch next year as well. Yeah, maybe we should hold. No, never. Maybe we should hold the teachers to uh, to an absenteeism level that's no higher than the students. Any other questions on the transfer request? 
So do we have a motion to accept the transfers as presented? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Four zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. And my final report for tonight is the report on the revolving funds. So what you have is a list of the revolving funds for Wareham Public Schools. What I did was I listed them all. Then the order that you see them in, you might say, why are they in this order, Kristen? That's just the order of the fund that they're assigned in the VADAR system. So however numerically they appear, that's how it is on here. So you can see they have the, I put in the FY23 beginning balance, the year to date revenue, projected revenue in that column is anything that I knew that we were going to get. So for example, the 35,000 from the town meeting article for McKinney Vento, the May and June payments from the ROTC and the April, May and June payments for school choice. Now there's other revenue that, that is going to come in, um, but certainly for example, uh, preschool tuition, but it's not as predictable as those that we know that we're going to get. The other column you see is a FY23 year to date expended and encumbered, and then a projected balance for, um, as of now, this is what it would be looking like for June 30th. Now certainly, you know, come June 30th, it, those balances could be quite a little different. Some revenue could come in. We could have, we have had further expenditures since the um, printing of this report in uh, the athletics account. So this is just a snapshot in time. Um, and what I also did is on the successive pages is I took each revolving fund and I gave some greater context. You'll see um, the projected balance, which is the projected June 30th balance, and then I gave some greater context to the revenues and the expenses to give you an idea of what are the revenues into these funds and what are the expenses out of these funds. And these are, these are looking at the expenditures from this year. So it's not just general, what can we, what do we take in and what do we expend? This is more specific to what we have taken in in these funds and spent out of these funds this year. And even though Circuit Breaker is not technically a revolving fund, I included it because um, it is a large source of revenue and expense for us, and I thought it important just to, you know, to have it on here and to just explain further. And you know, we can use it from one fiscal year to the next, um, and it does. It is a source of revenue and a source of expenditure. So that's why I just left it a little. I, made a space at the end, but I thought that it was important just for informational purposes to include it as well. So I'm not sure if anyone has any questions. I can certainly go through some of them if Jeff? you'd like. So putting aside circuit breaker, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the distinction, um, how much of the, you didn't total it, but it, I can see approximately what it would probably add up to, how much of the non-circuit breaker projected balances, and I appreciate the fact that they could change a little between now and June 30th, are, so to speak, encumbered for next year's budget? So for next year's budget, um, we do have, a, like you said, aside from circuit breaker, because we, we did, we are projecting to use in next year's budget $1 million in circuit breaker. Um, anything else? I don't think I'm looking at this list. School choice comes to yes. mind. Yes. Um, well, it would be for the, it's not necessarily encumbered per se, but we are paying out of school choice the the school share of the towns of the town HR director. So I would think that that would be, that's not in the local budget. So that would come from school choice. And uh, that's on page four, you'll see there our, our share. Um, to me, that also, might as well be encumbered. So out of, and out of, um, also out of school choice is the expenditures for the night school program as well. So those are not encumbered, but you know, they're in encumbered you know, a mental note that that needs to be used for for the night school. Because if we don't use use it, we'll have to find it from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. 
Can I ask, what, are, what are the, under school choice, it says designer services for Wayham Middle School and Wayham High School projects. Mm -hmm. Wh what is that? So that was, that was the middle school and high school MSBA projects that oh. we currently have. So that was the um, feasibility studies for the boiler and for the roof replacement. Okay. And we had some uh, town article funds that we used to, to pay for the costs that were incurred prior to getting fully accepted into the MSBA program and getting reimbursed. So those were some of the non-reimbursable costs. So the feasibility study. So at that point, we were coming to the end and those that's, we just had no other funds to fund them. So unfortunately, I mean, it is good that we have school choice funds because that is our, you know, our one of our last areas to fall back on. And just w w one more question in April, thank you. Um, under G Global Ed, we have mm -hmm. almost $47,000, and it says an expense program fee, so we, we pay that fee every year? I, um, that I'm not sure. We did have to pay it this year. It was right during the summer, so that came out in July or August, so that was the fee to, I think, to continue on in the program and to be part of the program. It was, I believe it was through the Department of Homeland Security, so it might have something, you know, some sort of registration fee or... So is that a program that the, the principals is, could explain to us maybe at the I, middle I school and high school? I would think so, they okay. could hopefully, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. April? So going back to, you said we pay a, a percentage of the HR for the town. Mm -hmm. Do you know how that's broken down? Because from my understanding, like the director of HR is also the assistant town administrator. So are we only paying the HR portion of the salary or is the whole salary of both positions split between every member of the, the town that would go through HR? Or do we only go through that portion of the salary? Right, that I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of that. I do know that our share this year was that we were asked to fund or part of an agreement I believe was 40,000 so I'm not sure you know entire how how that is Do you know how many other departments in the town are contributing to that salary I do not know okay. thank you you're welcome that's an interesting question April because I was under the impression that no other town department was contributing this was unique to us because we're a separate legal entity and we're getting a resource um, from a, another separate legal entity. Is that incorrect? I don't know if it's incorrect. I can't imagine. That, that, was, that was my assumption also, but right. April asked the question and it did make me think maybe, I, I would be shocked I, I don't if know. municipal maintenance was getting assessed right. something, for example, right. for, for an HR department you know, it would seem to me that that would be entirely, but we have the distinct pleasure of getting assessed because we're a separate legal entity. Right. That's my understanding. Do other districts have their own HR person, or is that something that is normally done through the town, and is it more cost effective if we have to utilize more to have an in-house HR person for just school things where we're not dealing directly with the town. So my experience has been <clears throat> that the school district has their own HR department or handles or someone in the district that handles HR. And we do not, we utilize through the town? I, I, would, I would say that I am the HR department. I do use um, the, the um, HR resource in the town, um, but as a resource. I am the one who handles all the HR issues. So I'm just curious like how that would break down if your or the superintendent as a, as a whole is basically doing the majority of the HR necessity, why we're paying $40,000 for a resource if we're not if it's not necessary. It just seems like a budget expenditure that we shouldn't be involved in if you're doing that work. I'm just curious, because that's, I mean, I, I know it's a drop in the bucket technically for our district, but if you're doing that work, that's a teacher salary, right. in my opinion. So it's just, I'm just, this, it's interesting to hear it broken down that way. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the history um, of, of why that started. Okay, thank I, you. 
think April's point is well taken. I, I, I But I think agree. the good news is any time we wanted to say, no, thank you, we could save the 40000 but we would simply be unable to call. On the other hand, we do have a, a labor attorney we can call as well. Um, so it's not like we wouldn't have a resource. Right. That's been my experience is that I have, in, in, as a superintendent in my previous position, I was the HR, and when I needed advice, I would speak with our attorney. Right. I, I don't know the history of this. I would, I'd be curious of it, um, and when that was put into agreement with the district, or the, the reasoning behind it, and if it's no longer, it might have been necessary at one time, but I don't, I don't personally feel like it might necessarily be necessary if it's going to put potentially like two paras or one teacher in the district and we need people in front of kids more than we need a resource for HR, so. And I'm Thank pretty you. sure it's a relatively <coughs> new thing because I'm also pretty sure that it didn't exist in my prior terms as a school committee member. So or you ju we just weren't aware of it, maybe. I think I would have been aware of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on revolving funds? Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Next up, we have the health and wellness report with uh, Mike and Joan. Good evening. Hi. Wellness. So the um, federal government requires districts to have a wellness policy and uh, we are also, districts are mandated to have a wellness committee. Um, the, before COVID, uh, we did have a, a wellness committee that was meeting and such. Uh, during the period of COVID, uh, it became defunct. We, we didn't really do wellness committee meetings during uh, the, the school years of COVID. Uh, we recognized this last school year and um, basically put together a plan for this school year to um, rejuvenate the wellness committee <clears throat> and also review the wellness policy. Now, the subcommittee for, for policy review has been routinely updating the wellness policy, but we wanted to make sure that we conduct it. Uh, there's a requirement for doing a triennial, triennial assessment and uh, technically, it should be the wellness committee that does it. And so we wanted to make sure that that was happening as well. Um, and besides the motivation that it was the right thing to do, um, also um, it was going to be part of the food services department's uh, administrative review this school year. Uh, so we wanted, I, I was very um, motivated to try to make sure that the district uh, had a, um, a good plan in place for the wellness policy and wellness committee. Um, we, um, with uh, Joan Siemens as our chairperson, um, we solicited uh, membership uh, for the wellness committee and, and stood it up uh, at the beginning of the school year and uh, reviewed the wellness uh, policy. And uh, Joan will be talking about that in just a minute. Uh, but. Um, we identified that while the wellness po policy met the minimum standards that the USDA had published, um, unfortunately, once we did the assessment, we found that there were, there were a lot of gaps, a lot of um, things where, where there was something lacking. So as part of the assessment, we were able to identify w what we should include in the policy. And so that was one of the things that the school committee, I'm sorry, the wellness committee uh, worked on through the school year. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Joan. Great, thank you. So the Wellness Committee met five times during this current school year. We had representation from teachers, from parents. Um, I gave you four documents, a sample, so I did give you the member list um, that you have. I gave you a sample of what our meeting agenda and posting looked like, um, so you could see that, things that we discussed. I gave you a sample of the notes that Mr. Russo took at each meeting, and then uh, we followed the open meeting law, so we approved those and um, 
kept those as well. And then I'll talk about the WellSat 3.0 and the WellSat I. Um, all of this information is on the district website under the food service tab. It's called health and wellness. So all of our agendas are there, all of the minutes are there, et cetera. So as Mike said, we came together to look at the um, school district policy and we had a tool that we were able to use to go through that particular policy and score it. It's called the WellSat 3.0. So that was one specific survey that the committee members did. And then we met together. Um, all of our meetings were by Zoom. And we had to score what we felt uh, we rated for that particular standard. And with the RUD Center that gives us the WellSat 3.0, they had guidelines and they had language as far as what we had to meet in order to get a score of a 2 or a score of a 1 or 0. So we did that. Um, You'll see on the WellSat 3.0 and WellSat I that you have in front of you, there's a scorecard that we got as a district. So the left side is based on the policy that we had. And as Mike said, we met some of the minimum requirements, but we knew we had a lot of work to do to beef that up. So from that particular exercise, we then looked to see, all right, we have a policy. How is it being implemented in the schools? So we used a tool called the WellSat I, again from this RUD Center, and I interviewed the principals in each school, and I interviewed the phys ed department and the health teachers from each school, and each um, category had their own separate interviews I had to do in, in scores. So we went through all of that, we shared all of that at our meetings, so you see those scores on the right-hand side of this particular chart. So from here, we know that we have some work to do in the schools, and we'll set that as some of the goals for next year. But we were able to revise the district policy that went before policy review, and then, as you know, for school committee, you did approve that. So that new policy is now on our district website. So that's what we're using going forth. One of the criteria from having the Health and Wellness Committee is updating the school committee based on the work that we've done. Um, so that's why Mike and I are here tonight. So we'll work with the principals. They recommend having uh, a school a school wellness committee. Um, I'll work with the principals on that. It could be part of their school council if they don't want to do another whole separate committee. So they have some um, flexibility in how they want to do that. And then just looking at some of the recommendations moving forth. So. That took all of five meetings to get through all of this information. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Well, I guess my main question would be, um, where do you think we have the most work to do? What, what, what areas can we beef up or would we, to benefit our students? I think one area is always the local like farm producing, and we try to do that. Um, phys ed is also another area where they want to make sure our kids are out and getting exercise and playing. So elementary, I know they have phys ed. Middle school, their, their schedule is just structured <coughs> differently. So they may make a recommendation on time with, with meeting time. It may not be what they are fully recommending, but we are making sure that we have recess involved and we have phys ed involved, up, you know, recess up to grade five at least. So do we need more phys ed as an example, or are we happy with where we are in that It's gonna regard? depend on the various schools, and, and again, when the principals look at what they need and, and needing classroom teachers versus you know, extra time for phys ed, that's when those difficult discussions have to be had. Well, I guess, have we been having those discussions, <laughs> is my question. I, a a as small as amount, just, yes, we have had, yeah, we've, we've the, had um, some discussion in that. The principals are aware of the recommended yep. um, amount of time mm -hmm. uh, that is what's recommended. Uh, we've had that conversation and then it's a question of um, having that as a goal, um, how can we get there or at least work towards it. So that is a conversation that has happened. Okay. And on, on the scorecard itself, a two is better than a one? Can I yeah, assume two that? Is okay. The best that you can have. 
But these are all self-reported scores then? I mean, this isn't like an outside group. The, the wellness committee itself gets together and comes up with this? Yes, sir, but okay. it's using metrics that they provide. They, as part of mm -hmm. the assessment kit, you have the tools to go through and is, is this in existence? Is this happening? Is that happening? And then you score it based on those questions. So basically twos you feel pretty good about and the ones might be areas for improvement? Yeah, potentially. Well, uh, well, zeros are definitely areas Zero. for improvement. Okay. Ones, you might make a conscious decision that one is meeting the need, or but two would be um, uh, ideal. Okay, thank you. April? So, based on this scorecard, do, does this get submitted somewhere, and does this have any effect on, um, like, phys ed, health, or nutrition funding? Um, no, it doesn't get reported. However, uh, the during our administrative review, uh, which happened in January, uh, one of the things that was looked at by DESI was uh, our wellness policy, and um, <coughs> where we stood with with our uh, updating of it and our triennial review and such. Uh, during that review, uh, some of the things that I had uh, said earlier were, were specifically noted. They noted that our existing policy, which had not yet been updated, uh, meant the minimum requirements, but it needed work, and that work has been achieved. Um, but um, beyond that, and, and they were complementary of what we had in place, uh, our team meetings and what was going on and the process. We explained everything and shared with them some of the materials that we were working on. And uh, so during the, during the administra administrative review, it is looked at. The administrative review happens once every four years. So it's not being looked at, as far as I know, um, more often than that. Now, DESI can certainly look at it through some other method, but the one, um, because food, is, food and uh, phys ed are two big players in it, but um, food is the one that they used their administrative review of the food service department to actually, they, they plugged the wellness into that review, and that's, that's when they look at it. Um, but I don't, I'm not aware of any other time that they would be looking at it, but as far as this assessment, we were not required to submit it to anyone. Okay, thank you. Indiana? Um, so, I was actually on the wellness committee um, a few years, well, m multiple years ago. Um, has there been any work to try to get a student representative on that committee? That will be our goal for next year. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, we just wanted to get started um, having the, the support from the teachers um, and parents, it, but we definitely want to have students involved. And now, um, with the review process, I, I just don't have it in front of me, so I'm curious, did that factor in things other than like physical activity, nutrition, like school wellness and mental health and stuff like that? Um, there is a section that does talk about you know, social emotional, mm -hmm. um, but it also talks about food that you sell after school or food that you might sell during the school day or drinks during the school day. So <coughs> it encompasses a great deal. There's, um, different categories here, nutrition education is one, um, school meals is one, standards for competitive and other food beverages, we have physical education and physical activity, wellness promotion and marketing, and then the implementation, evaluation, and communication. So it all kind of falls in one of those standards. Awesome. Thank you. And I think you were in the, the Fuel Up program. Yeah, middle yeah. School? yeah. That was, that's awesome, an awesome resource, too, for the, I'm sure it would be for the Wellness Committee. Yeah, and that's something when the schools start having a hand in this that maybe we can bring that back as Definitely. well. Definitely. Yeah. Thank Je you. Jeff? You also? Yes. Uh, under Section 2, the uh, standards for the USDA child nutrition programs and school meals, obviously this is somewhat easier for us because all our meals are free, um, both lunches and breakfasts. But I noticed you gave yourself, and I, that's an accurate statement, you gave yourself a one on, these are your scores, right? <coughs> yes, if you're looking at the uh, WellSat 3.0, but again, that had to do with the policy. policy. How, um, what did we have? So a lot of this, we were already doing it, 
Well, but I was specifically referring to the fact that you gave yourself a one as it related to um, specific strategies to increase participation. Um, where do you think you're falling down with respect to a strategy to increase participation when the meals are free? Well, um, two things. One, it's, it wasn't specifically listed in the policy, so we had to get wording in the policy. It wasn't specifically listed. Uh, that, that we needed to be look, working. So one of the things that, get, get, that was graded was did our policy have wording in it to direct us to work on improving participation, and it didn't. So we made sure we plugged that in there. Um, but we were working on improving participation. <laughs> so, um, so, right, so the WellSat 3.0, that first column, that's basically, <coughs> there were a lot of things going through there, not only on the food side, but on the health and physical education and all that, where we were doing the things, but we didn't have a requirement or a guidance in the policy to do it. So the I'm policy not, was not. graded. I'm good, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair. No problem. Any other comments or questions? So next year, when this group is up and run again, how, how <coughs> often would they meet during the course of a year? Would, do, would you anticipate meeting next year as a group? Probably another five times throughout the year. We started in October, mm -hmm. we ended in March. Okay, So. all right, great. Well, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You. Appreciate it. Congratulations, Indy. You've made all your principals in the district proud, so good luck <laughs> in your future. Next up, we have the Director of Student Services Report. <laughs> Melissa, thank you. Good evening. It is Special Education Parent Satisfaction Survey time. So we sent out our survey this year um, in hopes that we would have better participation than we did last year. Um, we tried to keep it very simple and easy. Um, I also, at Dr. D'Andrea's um, suggestion, used a Google form this year, which parents can access from their telephone. Um, if, so for parents who might not have access to a computer at home, they were able to do this on their cell phone because we figured most people have access to minimally a cell phone. Um, I tried to keep it focused on areas that are important to me when I'm looking at how we service our parents and families when it comes to special education. So I kept the um, questions to really kind of focus on customer service, which is really what we do for a business, um, for our parents and guardians and families in the district. Uh, we used a five-point Likert scale, so one is very satisfied, five is very unsatisfied, and then three was neutral and then satisfied and unsatisfied. Um, it was sent out to all 591 families who have students with active IEPs. That includes in-district and out-of-district students. Um, and we only got 69 responses, which was a little disappointing. But I have some plans on how to hopefully increase that um, next year. Was there a, any pattern to the ones that did respond? Um, it's tough because I feel like I, I my opinion is it's the same parents every year that respond to our surveys. <laughs> our numbers are very close. I mean, I'm going. And are they disproportionately out of district? Are they disproportionately no. associated with a certain, <coughs> uh, certain type of child? No, no. it's pretty much, um, it's, a, it's a pretty even split. Of, it's about 10% of each in district and out of district. So about five of the parents five to six of the parents had students with intensive needs who are out of district, and the rest were in district students. I don't aggregate the data by what disability the child has. I just look at parents in district versus out of district. I could probably further break it down if you wanted me to. I was, I was just curious. Yeah. But, but, but by the way, people who send out surveys, they're almost always disappointed with the results. Yeah. <laughs> I keep hoping one day, you know, we're going into year seven next year, so. I have, I have high hopes. Um, so um, our goal of doing this clearly every year is to gauge parents' satisfaction in the way that we service our students with special education, the way that we um, work collaborative, collaboratively, oh my gosh, I can't speak, with them, and also um, how easy it is for them to access support from administration and staff when they need to. So those are the five areas that I was looking for, and clearly we want to use this data to help drive us to be better at our jobs. 
So our first question um, revolved around convenience of scheduling meetings. So since COVID, um, we have had an, a, probably about a 40% increase in parent participation in IEP meetings, which is huge. And I feel that even after the, dist, uh, the Department of Education said, go back to in-person meetings, we continue to also offer the virtual meeting platform for parents. And about 80% of our parents still choose the virtual platform. And I think the reason for that is they don't have to take a day off of work. They can just go sit in their car. A lot of parents participate from their car and just take a quick break from work instead of having to take a half a day off to drive into school, find childcare, all of those different pieces. So we've had great success. So we want to make it as convenient as possible for families to schedule their IEP meetings for their students. So the question was, school district works with families to schedule IEP meetings at times and in a format that's convenient to them. Um, we had 60.9% say that they're very satisfied with that. I, I took that as a big win because we really try to accommodate our families um, and, and provide them with the time that makes sense for them and really work around their schedules as much as we possibly can within the constraints that we have with our, with our school day. Um, most of the questions that you see range between 71 to 76 percent in a favorable, neutral to very satisfied. Again, I take that as a big a win. I'd always love to see 90 to 100 percent, but I, I'm happy with the results of these questions. The second talks about um, parent or guardian voice. Do they feel like their voice is being heard when they bring concerns to us about their children? So. The question is, at my child's IEP meetings, critical issues are discussed regarding my child's services and education, and I feel like a valued member of my child's team, which that's the key, is making sure that they feel heard and like they're part of that team servicing their child. So again, 46.4, very satisfied, 20.3% satisfied, 8.7 neutral, um, so we're still above 70%. On, I call that positive, on the positive side. Um, number three, um, speaks about um, adequate opportunities com to communicate regarding my child and any questions and concerns. Again, we're at 44.9% very satisfied, 17.4% satisfied, and 14.5% neutral, above 70% on that one as well. <coughs> um, talking about consistency of programming and question number four, I feel that my child is receiving the services that they require to make effective progress in school. 43.5, very satisfied, 10.1, satisfied, 17.4, neutral. And then our last question was about collaboration, which is hugely important and one of my goals for this year. Um, when I need support for my child or have an issue, administration is supportive and collaborative in resolving them in a timely and professional manner. 44.9% very satisfied in that category. 13% satisfied and 14.5% neutral, again, above 70% of our families. So some conclusions and possible solutions, clearly not the participation we were hoping for out of 591 surveys. Um, some thoughts as we move forward to next year is to send robocalls and emails reminding parents and guardians that one, um, there's a survey coming explaining what the survey is and why it's important for them to participate in it. Um, by two, alerting them of the that the survey has been sent. And then a reminder, um, once the survey is out, um, that the survey is there. And if they have any problem accessing it, we can certainly reach out to help them with that. And I'm hoping that might increase our numbers. Um, again, the average uh, was 73.96% of the five questions were answered neutral to very satisfied, but still an average of 26.4 in the unsatisfied or very unsatisfied, unsatisfied range. So again, we continue to work with staff around improvements, um, more frequent and transparent communication, um, stronger collaboration with parents, and all these areas that we've identified. April? So, Sending out 591 surveys, and I know you said you used a Google form, is there a way to track bounce back? Is there a, a percentage of those 591 that did not actually get accessed? And would that give it a more accurate number if you are able to deduct anything that was bounced back as you know an incomplete email or anything like that? 
or is that 591 successfully went through not accounting for bounce back? We had seven bounce backs. Um, typically throughout the year, the schools and central office, especially my, my office in special education, because of the frequency that we send email um, documents to parents, especially DocuSign documents that are specific to their child's IEP or a meeting or a consent to do an evaluation, we are pretty diligent about making sure that the email addresses that we have are correct and working. So we did have seven bounce backs, and that can be people change their email address, leave a job, change providers, um, but only seven out of those 591 bounced back. So of the of that number, typically when you are sending like a docu or things, are those particular outside of the, you said it's typically the same people that participate. It, so well, I'll assume that that 69 is the norm of who would normally participate. Of the remainder of them, when you are having to send other correspondence, are you having issues getting responses to those generally as an email? Or do you think it was the survey itself that people just didn't feel was um, like, mandatory, you know, or required of them. Yeah, I, I certainly think that that is the issue. I think we had a lot of surveys that go out in the spring to parents and families, and um, also students and staff. So I think um, people get become weary of answering surveys. And so trying to explain um, the importance of the survey and also possibly switching the time of year that we do it. I like to do it in the spring because the whole year has gone by, but I'm thinking I might do kind of a pre pre-survey in the fall and then maybe try again later in the spring so that it's not overlapping with other surveys because I feel like, you know, it's not mandatory, right? We're asking people to take a couple minutes out of their time to give us some feedback so that we can improve. So I, I just think that for a lot of people, it, you know, they don't feel like they need to voice their opinion. Um, and honestly, it's, it's probably that things are going okay with them. Um, so they're not feeling like they have to give feedback. So it's either very positive feedback. I remember last year we did a survey, if you guys who were on the committee last year remember, with open um, responses where parents could respond. And it was a 50-50 split of parents who were raving about how wonderful the whole experience was for them. And the other 50% of those surveys were people who were just not happy with, with something. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, it, it's kind of a split of 50-50 with the responses that we get. So I was actually happy because our numbers went up for, on the positive side this year. So that's a small victory, I think, for the district. Do you feel that, it, and I think you're right in a lot of cases because I know that even in regards to what people respond to in general is either they're going to like post or share positive experiences or negative experiences and middle of the road people tend to remain neutral or like you said, unbothered. So that is an interesting way to look at it, that it's like status quo if they weren't. So it's almost like no news is good news uh, in a way. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a pollster, obviously, so I just wonder, can you get valid results if you only get 11% or 11.6% participation rate? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you know the answer oh, yeah. to that. <laughs> you think they can? You can still get bad results, yeah. I mean, I think that last year we had 80, so I'd have to look the number up, 80-something responses last year, and last year we were about 50 to 60% positive, and the rest were not positive. Um, strongly not positive, I would say. Um, so I think that this is an, uh, I feel like even though it's a small number of participants this year, I still feel like it, it gives a good snapshot of this particular time of um, some form of satisfaction, even though it's that 11% of the parents, I feel like we've gone up in our satisfaction rating and the number of responses is not that far off from last year. But 100% but of parents had the opportunity to give their opinion had they chosen to do so. Correct. Okay. Um, so I think doing a self-evaluation is, is great. It shows initiative. And um, have we done other self-evaluations that maybe survey other aspects other than parents? Uh, you had mentioned maybe like, like staff, like even regular ed staff and special ed staff, or even maybe students, especially high school students. We want to be able to advocate more for themselves and actually be a part of the whole IEP, maybe start in middle school, part of the IEP process. Do we do that too? Or are there plans to do that in the future? So we have a parent and a student survey that go out every spring. Um, I have not done a special education um, specific one, and I think it would be difficult 
um, and it, I, I'm not sure how accurate it would be due to the fact that many of our students re will re require adult assistance, mm -hmm. which kind of skews the... Well, I understand. You, yeah, you don't want right. to highlight yeah, or stigmatize exactly. anybody. Um, but staffing, certainly you could mm -hmm. do, right? And to Absolutely. Find yeah. out. And the staff do get a survey every year, and the whole student body gets a survey every year, but not specific to special ed, just general, you know, do you feel... I'm sure you guys have seen the survey that goes out. To right. Yeah. I was just wondering if there's ever one, ever considered doing one just related to special ed to see what the feel is in within the buildings. Mm -hmm. I could. Yes. Okay. Brennan. Just a suggestion, but why not um, give the surveys out with the report cards? Because I know that for a lot of the kids, they have to have their report cards signed and brought back. Mm -hmm. And my son is a special ed student. I took mm -hmm. the survey. It was remarkably easy. It took mm -hmm. no time. Right. You know, so it... And, not to say that no thought was put into it, but it's, it's you know, I can't imagine parents seeing it and going, I, I can't, it's too much. You know, it was, it was right. very, very easy and simple. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I think it was just a question of, you know, making sure it gets right in front of their eyeballs and right. stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. and I think that tying it with report cards, <coughs> I mean, because that's something every parent is waiting to see and yeah. waiting to get and trying to follow up on. Maybe that would be the best way to do it. We could certainly try a paper copy. Um, you know, Even if not a paper copy with the report card, just a reminder. A reminder. Like, yeah. like by signing the report card, you acknowledge that you know you know there's a survey available at blah 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 dot com or what, you know however mm -hmm. yeah, whatever method idea. or instrument we're using. Yeah, thank you. That's a good idea. Any other questions? My <laughs> opinion is people are incredibly busy in general. Mm -hmm. If they're if they're reasonably happy, they don't take the time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's that simple. I ask, I ask people how I run into, um, my wife happens to work with someone whose child goes, and she loves uh, student services. Mm -hmm. But my guess is, and I'll ask her, did she fill out the survey? Yeah. You know, so I, I admire the fact that you're trying, but I wouldn't uh, lose sleep over the fact that you only got 10% or whatever it was. Yeah. A little more than 10% response. Thank you. I just have one more. Able? It, it's IEP specific only, not those on 504 accommodations? Correct. Okay. I just, I pulled the active IEP list and that's 591 right now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have the superintendent's report. All right. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start by saying uh, thank you and congratulations to Indy. Um, thank you for what you've done on this committee. I think you've been um, an exemplary um, um, representative of the student body, and you've done a terrific job, so thank you, and congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. I do want to point out, having been around a long time, every person they send the high school sends for this position is an outstanding individual. Yeah. I agree, India's done a great job, but we've had other outstanding individuals too. So I applaud the, the, the uh, who, who actually makes the decision? Was Mrs. Medina? S student Council, it's an it's a election. Okay, they elect well. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do, because I've seen in some of my other positions some that are not so effective, and so, but you've been terrific, so thank you. Um, Okay, so you have my uh, newsletter, and um, I have the, the payroll and bill warrants, and I ask for you to approve those, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Staying 400. Thank you. I have also, uh, for your consideration for approval, a scholarship fund. We have received a donation um, from John and Betty Parks. Um, I've done some research, research on these folks. Um, I haven't been able to learn too much, but I know that they grew up in the area. I know that John grew up in Marion, um, and he, he attended Tabor Academy. Um, I suspect that Betty um, attended Wareham High School. I don't have um, confirmation of that, so that's just that's just what I suspect in the research that I've been able to do. They um, passed away a few years back. She passed away in 2014. He passed away in 2017. 
Uh, they had sin significant amount of money that they donated to a number of different uh, schools, organizations, and groups. Uh, one of the schools was Wareham High School, um, and they wanted to donate a percentage of um, their estate to the high school, and that um, amounts to $689,692.06, which is um, a significant amount of money that we will use for, um, for scholarships for our graduating seniors. Um, right now, we have received the money. It is in a bank account. Um, the town received the money, put it in a bank account that has an uh, interest rate of 4.41%. Uh, we're looking to begin um, providing scholarships with this money for the class of 2024. Um, so what I'm asking for you this evening is to vote to accept the money. Um, and then I, I have spoken with Mr. Sweat about this a little bit. He has some thoughts uh, on how we might um, put a group together to, to, to manage this money so we can make sure that we get the maximum amount of interest that we can use to provide our students with some scholarship money. Uh, and that's certainly something that we can work on down the road. Um, but um, that's where we are with it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and then I would just ask for a, a vote to accept April? the money. Yeah, is, is there, um, obviously whenever there is a scholarship, there is usually um, criteria mm -hmm. as to who is able to apply. Um, I find that when it's in um, memoriam of um, particular people, I think finding um, or having, if I see that you've mentioned a committee to establish the application and the rubric, um, but I find that, you know, doing some history, like you've been trying to dig up on the, um, the donors and their legacy mm -hmm. um, and what they were passionate about and what meant the most. So I don't know if there's contact with their family, um, but I find that if, especially in a memoriam, trying to find uh, much like the, I think the Midge Roby for nursing students, things like that, um, to find out what was important to them to keep their legacy, especially with a, a monetary donation of this size. I think is really important in keeping the integrity of the donation. Um, I agree 100%. And um, we, uh, there is some research. He worked for Boeing. He um, was into, um, um, he was very knowledgeable about flight. And um, he, some of the, the money that they donated went to a, a museum on flight to his school in which he studied flight. Um, and so that was one of his passions. Uh, they also um, loved animals, and they, they donated much of their, their money to, to um, organizations that, that care for animals. So those are two that we could look at. But I do agree that I was able to find that they do have some relatives uh, that were in the area that we could, um, if we could contact them and reach out and get more information. I think but, that would be good. Yeah, and I think that that's something that um, when we put a committee together uh, that I think should include um, uh, one or two school committee members, uh, that that would be a decision we would make. Okay, thank you. Matt, I just want a clarification on the number. The document we have says 624,000. I think you said 689. Is Which one are we voting on? <laughs> Okay. So the, what he said is correct. Oh, okay. That's right. So, so we make a motion to be the 689. Already made money. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the money was invested, so as the market I got shifts. It. Yeah, that makes sense. It's growing by thousands every month. <laughs> yeah. I got to get into that account. All right, do I have a mo accept. motion to accept? Any other discussion? Just, yes. Um, this motion to accept, does that mean that control over the funds, once we've uh, voted on this presumably successfully, will become the, will then shift in, from the control of 
the town treasurer, which I believe you said who is currently in control of this account, will shift to the control of the finance director under the who is it seems me we seems to me we need some specificity in this motion because <coughs> in my opinion it probably never should have been under the control of mm -hmm. the treasurer because it wasn't given to the town mm -hmm. and and it seems to me since we are the governing body that it should be under the control of the school committee who can then of course delegate that to the superintendent as as it sees fit et cetera et cetera but i i like the motion to have a little bit more specificity so i can i, I don't i don't know the uh, all the legal components of this and when you know who should accept it and then who has control over it i do know that the money was donated to wareham high school right and you are the CEO of that entity, and we are the governing body Correct. of that entity. Correct. Um, with all due respect to Scott. <laughs> um, so it, it does seem to me that the, the motion probably ought to say uh, something about the, the control, who controls this money now that it's being, with this motion, being transferred from the town treasurer to the school district. Is this something we may need Greg's input on? I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, it's if, just with if, the sum of money. Right. I agree with Jeff. There should be some specificity on who is. Yeah, I've I've already had, and it was it was a totally constructive conversation, an informal conversation with Derek, mm -hmm. and because it's so much money, you mm -hmm. know, he uh, he wants to make sure that it is handled well, right. um, and I don't blame him, right. and I'm sure the. Uh, the uh, the parks want it to be handled well right. so would this be something that we could put on our f move to our final agenda pending our a conversation with greg on how the finances will be directed and then make a mo rescind the motion to accept the donation until we have clarity uh, i'm i'm happy uh, I'm, and I'm fine with that. that. And by the way, I completely since it's not for the class of 2024 right. anyway, so I it's completely not. trust John Foster. There's right. no question about right, that. Right. And I know at 4.4 percent interest or whatever it is at the moment, it's earning thousands, and he's not going to move it. So right. any delay is not going to do anything bad financially. Right. So I'm happy. I can between now and the next meeting, I'll work with Greg, uh, get you guys all the information. If we, you know, for if there's any specific motion that we need to, to and, make. And in your conversation with Greg, you know, they had to establish an account <laughs> into which this money went, mm -hmm. okay? That account had to have, had to have a signatory associated with it, mm -hmm. and that, and this new account will have a different signatory, so that I think April's right. We may want to make sure we do it very carefully to make sure that when we dot the I's and cross the T's, they're the right the right I's and the right T's. And I think Kristen should be involved, obviously, in that conversation as well, since usually she's overseeing all things financial for the district. All good. And if you want my input, I'll be happy to, to join in the process. Excellent. Thank you. So that motion has been, re we had a motion to rescind. Yep. Do, do I have a second? second. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if Greg has a motion in mind. Right. Um, yes. So all in favor to rescind aye. the original motion, aye. Yes, aye. Four zero zero. So we'll stay in a holding pattern until the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, and that is all I have for my report. All right. So next up, we have school committee report. And first up is the school committee calendar, which you should have a hard copy in front of you right now. I don't know if Dr. DeAndre, do you want to take us through this calendar or? or um, okay. These basically mirror the types of meetings and times of meetings we had this year, correct? Exactly, yeah. So this uh, same number of meetings um, aligned with the, the days and times that we are um, allotted for this room. Um, and we also just um, noted what um, we intend for to be on the agenda for those meetings, such as the big budget, items, the right. budget, budget votes, mid-cycle review for superintendent, things like that. Um, 
So, April, did you have a question? I, I, not necessarily a question, but can I ask that, um, not that it's a mandatory, because obviously these are usually something, can we put the MASC joint and MASS joint conference on our calendar on the website? Just, it, I think it's important it, for any of us that are attending, um, just that the dates are there because it is something that we are representing the town and we are going, um, you know, generally to those conferences. So just that it's listed Absolutely. on the calendar. We can do mm -hmm. that. Okay. Okay. I, I know you all know it's my favorite thing on the planet, <laughs> but. <laughs> Jeff? Um, and I guess you'd call this a correction, but the December 7th public hearing, um, based on what we're looking at on the <laughs> bottom, that implies that it's gonna take place in this room, but I doubt that's the case. Aren't we gonna do it in the middle school auditorium? We did schedule it for this year. Really? Is that because it's, it's not the most popular event <laughs> that we ever have? We'll have plenty of extra seats. <laughs> I think it depends on the year though, because we've had public hearings where the auditorium was Correct. very full I think that that should we should is there a way to have that as a backup depending on the um, agenda for that meeting we can WCTV has been short-staffed and it's um, they're there for about two and a half three hours to set up when we're at the middle school so uh, we kind of alleviate that for them um, good point it's been a short meeting Traditionally, the last couple of years after the quick presentation, there usually isn't much after that. You're 100% correct. We think it will be bigger. We can certainly change it. I think just having it in the background that dependent on the agenda and what, what, uh, how the public interest seems to be swirling around it, it might not be a bad idea to have a backup plan yeah. or an overflow or something. What a lovely thought. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? So is there a motion to accept the meeting dates with the addition of the conference and mass conference so date? Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, four zero zero. And our last order of business for school committee report is the school committee subcommittees and negotiation teams. So uh, I contacted people individually uh, a little bit between last meeting and this meeting to talk about possible committees you might be interested in. Basically, a lot of it's going to stay the same. I think uh, people did a nice job in the roles they were in this year. So as we go forward, in terms of uh, negotiations, cafeteria will be uh, Joyce and April. Bus drivers will be myself and Brennan. Custodians will be April and myself. Unit A, which is under negotiations th this upcoming year, will be Jeff and Joyce. Unit B, under negotiations this year, will be Jeff and April. Unit C, Perez, will be Joyce and Jeff. And Unit D, clerical under negotiations this year, will be myself and Brennan. In, in terms of subcommittees, policy review, uh, I'd like to keep it at April in, in Brennan. Budget is appointed by the superintendent, and he indicated to me that he would appoint Jeff and myself if we were interested, so congratulations, Mr. Sweat. Um, Cape Cod Collaborative, uh, Brennan volunteered to be part of that this year. That's a change. Thank you, Brennan. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Onset Scholarship, April and Brennan. Superintendent Evaluation, Joyce and Jeff. Uh, the Communications and um, Public Relations Subcommittee, April and Brennan. And then I did want to add another subcommittee this year called the Alumni Subcommittee. And the purpose of that committee is to highlight Wareham alumni that have gone on to do successful things in a variety of areas and to recognize alumni from a variety of decades. Uh, I would like to focus primarily, I think, on recent graduates, but open to all decades. And to that end, if you saw Wareham Week, there is a place where members of the public can nominate uh, recent or long-term, <laughs> long time ago graduates for us to contact, for the subcommittee to contact. We'd have a questionnaire for them, and part of that questionnaire is what did Wayham Schools mean to you? What, what skills did you learn from the Wayham Public Schools? What did you take away from being part of the Wayham Public Schools? And to publicize this going forward, so we'd be on our website, uh, so we'd, we'd turn that information over to April and Brennan, uh, be on Twitter, Facebook, and then Wareham Week has agreed to make a part of an occasional series where they would take some of those that we put on our website and publish it in Wareham Week as well going forward. 
Um, so that kind of happened pretty quickly, a little quicker than I anticipated, but um, I'd like to start that at some point this summer if possible. Uh, so having said that, um, those are the assignments. Anyone, any great concerns or refusals? <laughs> Perfect, seeing none, those will be. <laughs> if there are any, we're assigning them to Joyce. <laughs> those will be the subcommittee and negotiation assignments for 23-24. Is there any other business to be conducted this evening? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, Four zero zero. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>